Okay, so welcome to the second session of this uh, second week of the conference. So I'm, I'm Nurunal, I, I will be chairing this session. First speaker is Leo Widmar from University of Ljubljana. Yeah. Okay, can you hear me well? Let me first thank the organizers for inviting me to this beautiful environment. So the title of my talk is Scale Invariant Critical uh, Dynamics. And also let me at this point uh, acknowledge my collaborators. Um, Yeah, so um, Jan was my former PhD student from Ljubljana, Miroslav is a postdoc, he's here, there, in the green t-shirt. And let me also acknowledge other collaborators from Ljubljana, Poland, Germany, Belgium, also Piotr is here. Okay, so uh, we had uh, already uh, an exciting first week of the, of the conference um, and, and uh, today's morning lecture, so um, let me first summarize what we have heard so far, what we have seen. So if I can really do just a brief summary to have um, one uh, picture of the summary, to thermalize or not to thermalize, why is that an interesting question or why is that a hard question? So here, this is one over L. L is the system size, number of lattice sites. G is some, let's say, um, parameter that let's say introduces interactions or breaks integrability or something similar. So why is this a hard question? This is a hard question because um, typically we are in these windows. And so if you just look through these windows, everything looks very similar. But we know actually it's not. So in this case, this is called pre-thermalization. This is called new phase of matter. This is called ergodicity breaking phase transition. Okay, that is the brief summary. Now, let me now give you, before I really start, let me give you one uh, um, more slide to, to, to um, present my main message of this talk. So this is the, this is the photo that I took while, while traveling here, you see, uh, during the night to, to, to Bangalore. This is city, this is apparently sky. So um, this is something that is complicated, but eventually has some universal properties that can be a metaphor for thermalization, energodicity, and, and chaos. In the other extreme, there is something that is more simple, but also special at the same time. So that can be a metaphor for non-interacting, integrable, and so on. And if we want to understand the transition, the first very basic question that is present everywhere, but we don't ask that very often, is where to start. So in most approaches, I would say in the literature, actually, we start from something special, simple but special, simple because it's easy, is easier to treat and then go in this direction. In a smaller fraction of studies, including some of my studies, we start from this direction and then go there. But actually in this talk, uh, neither of these two scenarios will be considered, at least for the main results that I will present you. Instead, I would like to argue something else. I would like to argue that actually, um, if one goes directly to the boundary, now, if we call it boundary of chaos or critical chaos, this, this word is not fully settled, but I will just call it criticality. In finite systems, you see something special. You see some universality that is different from this universality that I think requires, should require more attention in the future. Okay, so let me start with, with simple questions. So let me come back to this, to this uh, dilemma and let me first ask the question, why is establishing a goodicity breaking transition a difficult problem. And as a warm up, uh, let me, let me um, give you one lesson, warm up lesson learned from non interacting systems. So, what do I want to say about non interacting systems? I will again go to Anderson localization that I, I think most of you are familiar with that, at least on a basic level. That is the Anderson model. It has hopping and, and disorder, like we, we have heard in the last lecture. 
I have in mind three dimensions, Anderson model in three dimensions, one and two dimensions are somehow special. In three dimensions, that, that, that is a well, there is a well-established metal to insulator transition at some critical disorder. In this unit, it's around 16.5. So um, I, I'm, the, the lesson I want to here present is the lesson how to detect Anderson transition from the dynamical perspective, from the perspective of non-equilibrium quantum dynamics. So what is a typical example for, of a quench we can do in order to address this question. This is a, a, pos, a possible quench we can do. So we increase particle density and one edge have low particle density on other edge. And then we ask, what is the time scale that this excess density here travels to the other edge? And again, I'm interested in 3D systems. So that's just one layer of the, of the cubic lattice. Okay. So let's say linear dimension of the lattice is L and the point relevant for my entire talk is this L is finite. I don't send anything to infinity. And the question that I'm asking is how does the relaxation time scale with L at the localization transition? So as you can imagine, if, if we are in the diffusive regime, that time scale with scale will, will be proportional to L squared. If we are completely localized, probably there is no relaxation at all. But how about exactly the localization transition? This is now something I would say well established and probably perhaps it, um, um, it's um, fair to say it goes back to early work by Taules and, and co-workers. And that's why this time is called nowadays Taules time. So in this case, Taules time scales is L cube. L cube and, and some of you already uh, understand what, where I'm pointing to. This L cube is actually the inverse of the level spacing of the single particle spectrum in this model. Just a remark, historical remark. Actually, uh, this study was, was carried out with a focus on 2D systems. Um, and, and as you know, between 58 and 79 for 21 years, it was widely believed, understood that there is a transition even in 2D. Okay, so here, now you can ask, is there some specific quench I'm showing you or where can one detect that? Well, I would argue one can detect that almost, almost anywhere. So we had, we had some fun during the, the COVID times by reproducing Edwards and Taules' result 50 years later. Of course, we did it for 3D, not to repeat. Of course, there is study from 72, and American study was an amazing study for that time. Right. So 50 years later, how does it look like? We literally follow what, what they did in their paper. We calculated the spectrum, and then we perturbed it by changing the boundary conditions on one edge. We got the perturbed spectrum. Then we took the energy differences. This is what we call Edward Stowell's energy. And we divided these differences by the level spacing, single particle level spacing that scales as one over L cube. One has that, one sees a clear scale invariant point, exactly the transition. So this vertical line is not our result, it's the best result from the literature, the converged result. And you see that matches perfectly, okay? That is essentially, so if Stowell's and Edwards had access to better computers, computers in 72, they would solve it completely. Okay, now from a more modern perspective, what we um, now typically do is, is we calculate spectral form factor. This is the spectral form factor, the definition. I will come back to the spectral form factor in next slides. From the spectral form factor, one can extract, again, the time called, that we equivalently then call Taules time, and then rescale the Taules time with the Heisenberg time. Ta Heisenberg time is just the inverse of the level spacing. So Heisenberg time scales L cube. And then one plus this ratio as a function of disorder. And again, scale invariant point. And again, this is not our result. That's the result from the literature. It, it works perfectly. Okay. So the lesson is here clear at the transition point Taules time scales Heisenberg time. Now let's go back to interacting systems. So Based on this analogy, based on this lesson we learned from non-interacting systems, what do we expect? How should Taules time at ergodicity breaking phase transition scale with L? Well, as I said, as I argued, it should scale with the Heisenberg time, the inverse level spacing. But now if we want to be more quantitative, in non-interacting systems, that is like L cube, right? You say, okay, it's large, but maybe not so large, depends. But in interacting systems, this is exponentially large, exponentially in L, okay? So now here we, here we immediately enter into this question, 
What does this mean? How long is that? That's super long. And I will come back to this discussion in a few slides, but at this point, let me actually ask a simpler question. Let me ask the question, are these things that I have written here for interacting systems really the case? Because you hear these arguments quite often in discussions or maybe in papers, but do we have some evidence that this is really the case? So that in interacting system, there is a goodisty breaking phase transition at tau less time scaling exponentially in L. Do we have at least one example? And four or five years ago, when, when, when I started to be interested in that, I didn't have such example. And nowadays, now I think I have at least one example. So I will now go to this example, which is from the last two years. I've been now slightly nonlinear in time, but our, our research is nonlinear in time. We do things first that we should do later, and we do things later that we should do first, and so on. You know how that goes, okay? So I will try to be here pedagogical, but, but nonlinear in time. Okay, so let me now go, let me argue that there is one example where this is indeed the case. So what I'm writing you here is indeed holds true. And these are the models that, that, that go within the so-called quantum avalanche picture introduced by, by Wojciech de Rook and Francois Houvenier. So that is one example of such, of such models. There are particles, uh, spin one halves within the core that interact all to all. There are N particles. N is kept fixed when the thermodynamic limit is taken. And then there are L particles outside the dot. So L, L particles outside the dot have connectivity just to one particle within the dot. Okay, and thermodynamic limit is taken by sending L to infinity. And so for the apparent uh, reasons, we call, we, call, we call this model quantum sun model. And recently we, we established the, uh, uh, the phase diagram of, of, of this model. This model, as I will argue in the next slides, has, I would say, the, a well-defined ergodic to non-ergodic phase transition. Critical point is multifractal. It exhibits many body mobility edge argued in this, shown in, in this paper, and so on. So let me show you the model Hamiltonian for this, uh, for this model. It consists of three parts. So within the dot, there is all-to-all -all interactions modeled by GOE matrix. Outside the dot, there are random fields, but these random fields are order one. That is not the transition in this model. It's not disorder-driven transition. It is actually interaction-driven transition. Interaction here is alpha. So there is an interaction SX, SX, one spin outside the dot, one spin inside the dot. And alpha, alpha is smaller than one. Alpha to some power UJ. UJ is essentially J. J goes from one to L. That's how we label spins, from the distance between the central region, okay? So clearly, the most distant spin, for example, this spin is, has the weakest coupling, and that is the bottleneck for, for thermalization. Yeah, NJ, it means that for a given, for a given spin outside, uh, J is the spin outside, the, outside the, the dot, we pick a random, in this model, we pick a random spin within the dot with, with which it interacts. Yeah, that's a random spin within the dot. What's UJ? UJ is the, is the, is the draw, and it's, it's essentially J, it's, it's, it's slightly random in, in a narrow interval, but uh, for, for the understanding of this, it's, it's enough to understand that it's just J. Okay, so that type of models have been, have been studied um, um, uh, before in, in the context of, of avalanche physics in 1D systems. Now here, what I want to argue is that I'm interested in this model as such. I, I find them interesting per se, because of the apparent reason that there is a well-defined ergodicity breaking transition, I'm not establishing any connection to 1D physics. In fact, the results that I'm going to show, at least these that I will discuss here, have no appear to have no similarities with results in 1D systems. Now, if I have to argue one reason why is this really a good model, why I encourage you all to, to take a look at that, is that apart from numerical arguments, one can have a very good analytical estimates of the transition point. And I will show in the next slides that the transition point occurs at alpha at one over square root of two, which is 0 0.707. So, and, and numerical results that, that we obtained, they agree with this prediction on the first digit. So the first digit is seven, and then the second digit, there, there is some ambiguity. I will not go into details. So the, the, the results that I'm gonna show you here correspond to more, more or less the transition around 0 0.75. Okay, so 
let me comment on the on the avalanche theory that is behind this this model uh, description so we had last week we had um, two talks one by david hughes one by anatoly Polkonikov. they both touched upon this uh, uh, theory even though they use different terminology so um, they were not very synchronized so what is the what is the avalanche theory the avalanche theory now i'm just uh, replotting this this system by um, again assuming that i mean um, modeling the, this dot as being fully ergodic and then the spins outside the the core i just ordered them j equal one two three i just ordered them in the row so the avalanche theory tells you that first if you are if there if the coupling is zero then this is fully non-ergodic system but avalanches can proceed in the sense that this ergodic dot thermalizes or hybridizes with with the with the non-ergodic part and then what you should what um, the, the objects that are here relevant are the matrix elements between the ergodic grain and then the uncoupled spin and the level spacing. So the matrix elements here for this theory, if you recall my picture from the, from the, from the airplane, it's from the, going from below to the top. So going from the ergodic regime to the, towards the transition. So for the matrix elements here, ETH is assumed. So that is these matrix elements are modeled within the ETH, ETH this is the coupling and then square root of the density of states. And level spacing is, is inverse of the many body density of states. Exactly, exactly, exactly. I will come to that, yeah. V, uh, here I just put G, but of course this G is alpha to J. Yeah, I will have it in the next slide. So then what one, what one requires here to, uh, to get an estimate of the transition is the so-called hybridization criterion. You take the, uh, matrix element divided by the level spacing clearly that is then g times square root of rho so g now coming to your question is in this model is alpha to j right j goes one two three and so on rho is two to the j times the density of states of the of the dot but that is fixed that does not scale with j so then if one asks when is this when is this uh, uh l independent when j goes to l l goes to infinity well that happens at alpha one over square root of t uh, so one over square root of two so in the talk by by by, by david hughes last year uh, last week uh, he used here k instead of two and he had two directions so k was four when anatoly talked about that he replaced alpha with e to one over psi psi was localization land but since i'm not making connection to 1d i'm just keeping here alpha okay so um, let me now show you how that works um, in, in reality when one does the calculation. So this is the calculation for the tauless time. This is calculation for the tauless time. This is the transition point. This is above the transition point, above the transition, uh, alpha larger than the transition point. It's ergodic here in this model. So now here I'm showing you that as like a, a maybe expected result. For me, when I first saw that, it was highly unexpected. So what these results show you? This show you that the tauless time here in, indeed increases exponentially with L, even in the ergodic regime. And then there is a prefactor F. F depends on, um, F depends on uh, alpha. So when alpha decreases towards uh, uh, the transition, the slope increases. And actually, the, the beauty is that this F of alpha can be even estimated analytically, assuming that the a tauless energy is given by the weakest link. That's an, an approximation that works rather well. And now one can compare tauless time to the Heisenberg time and have a conjecture that this ratio at the ergodicity breaking transition is a constant. It's a constant while if you flow to one extreme or another extreme, you either flow to ergodicity or you break ergodicity. Mm -hmm. The tauless time is extracted from the spectroform factor. Um, The tauless time is extracted from the spectral form factor when the spectral form factor reaches the ramp. I will show this ramp in the, in the next slides. Yeah. So this is extracted independent of the Heisenberg time. Heisenberg time is simpler because it's the inverse level spacing. You can even calculate it analytically. Okay. This is, let's say, an expectation. Now, how does that, that works numerically? Um, how does that works numerically? It works like this. This is the ratio as a function of alpha, and then we again in clear analogy also to Anderson localization, we see this scale invariant point located here at the, at the transition. Okay, so 
Now I go back in time. Now I go to, yeah. Is there any reason that you're calling the Taoist time and the Heisenberg time having a constant ratio as a transition as opposed to a ratio of exactly one? Yeah, because, um, yeah, thank you for this question. Uh, I, I did not go into details how I really extract Taoist time, but the way how one, how one can extract it from the spectral form factor is accurate up to a constant prefactor. I don't know the constant prefactor, I just know how it scales with the parameters of the system. That's why I just require here to be a constant and not one. In the ideal world, I would require even one. Yeah. Okay, now let's go back in time. So let's go back to, um, uh, uh, the, to MBL in disordered spin chain. So what was the challenge here? The challenge was actually that the, the exponential in L Taoless time was not observed. Instead, it was something else that was observed, exponential in disorder. So this figure that I took from our paper is rather involved, but what, what they want to show, the only thing that we, that we want, the main thing that we wanted to show here is that actually this rapidly increases, the Taoless time rapidly increases with W, W is disorder. Of course, that increases so rapidly that, that even after ra rather weak disorder, round two or so in the Heisenberg chain with, with a random field, you already break ergodicity. Capital omega, capital, uh, capital omega is a numerically extracted prefactor. It's around 0 0.3 here in this case. But it depends, that it depends on the model. If you take J1 and J2, it's a different number. Okay, so this is the puzzle, because uh, if there is exponential scaling in W, very easily in finite system, you become non-ergodic, very easily. But if that persists, and of course, we don't know if that persists or not for larger disorders. But if that persists, then Taoless time will never reach Heisenberg time in the thermodynamic limit. Of course, as I said, at that time, we were limited to rather narrow interval of disorders. Then later, many people did more, even more sophisticated studies and, 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 and um, could, could verify that actually. Predictions that this is one example from recent work by, by Dries Sells. He had a different setup. He had low disorder, high disorder regions, so on. But the bottom line is that he rescaled the time essentially identically as, as we predicted here. So with E to W, and then showed that this, there is this universal, that this time scale is still relevant in terms of this universal curve even a disorder as high as 12. Now, what we, I think, all agree, I probably all agree here, and, and that was also part of discussion last, last week, is that if one now really plugs in the numbers, what are these times, a disorder around 15 to 20, this is the age of the universe. Now, this comes to the first message, which is, which is like warm up message, and then I will speed up. <laughs> so that's one. One indeed needs to wait until the Heisenberg time, so the Taoless time to reach Heisenberg time to establish your goodisty breaking transition. So now, is this a positive or negative message? One can argue in either directions, right? One may say it's a positive message because one can, these times are so long, one can use it in some devices or some protocols. Or it's a negative message because it means that maybe experimentally we will not be able to determine whether that's a phase transition or not and so on. But that this discussion is not the, 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 the main point of this talk. What I would like to show you in the reminder of, the, of this talk is something else. It's some new message. And this new message is that I would like to argue and encourage you and to inspire you that we can do better. That it's, it's possible to detect the transition actually at much shorter times. Little disorder, if you use quasi-periodic kind of yeah. disorder, so then what is the, like, this kind of uh, scale invariant, like T Taulus by uh, T Heisenberg. So for that particular case, I, I, don't, I, I don't know quantitative predictions. I, I would assume qualitatively the same, but I, I don't know about the numbers. Okay. So the main message of, of my talk is to go beyond that, to show that actually we don't need to wait for such long times in finite systems to see clear smoking guns of the ergodicity breaking transition. And if that is the case, then this is certainly a positive message. Okay, so now let me again um, present you 
few other important lessons that we learned that are important for the, for the results that I'm going to present. The first lesson is a lesson learned from ergodic systems. So as I said, the point of my talk is not about ergodic system, it's about the criticality. But let me argue one thing that we learned that is important for my talk, for the, what we learned from ergodic systems. So the first lesson is about the spectral form factor that's given here, 1 over d. d is the Hilbert space dimension. The first lesson is that there is scale invariant ramp in the spectral form factor, defined in this way, and that probably goes back to Berry and so on. The, the literature is very broad. So how does that look like? That is the Anderson model below the transition in the diffusive regime. That is a quantum sun model in the ergodic regime. Time is measured in units of scale time. Of course, experts know that we did here unfolding and so on, but if, if you're not familiar with that, we just divided by the Heisenberg time. And then this is the ramp. This is the scale invariant ramp given by random matrix theory prediction. You can call it order parameter of ergodicity and so on. That's not, that's beautiful, well understood. That's not actually the lesson I want to take from that. The lesson I want to take is slightly other perspective on the spectral form factor. Yeah. Sorry? No, G was the ratio. G was the ratio between the Taulis time and the Heisenberg time. No, when you were writing previously, okay, sorry. That small g you are generating a spectral uh, form factor? You mean here? Um, sorry. So, you want? No, yeah. I, I don't know which line. Okay, okay. Maybe, k is the spectral form factor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. K is the spectral form factor. Yeah. Sorry, there was some confusion. Um, k is the spectral form factor. That is a scale invariant form of, of the spectral form factor. What I would like to argue here, I mean, maybe it's a trivial point, but I, I just want to be uh, clear. Um, this is a scale invariant form. How this is routinely now used in, in numerical studies. Um, but how actually we understand that? So let me just present a slightly different perspective on the spectral form factor. And this is that spectral form factor can be seen as survival probability of a special initial state, initial state that is equal uh, weight superposition of Hamiltonian eigenstates. Then one defines uh, survival probability, and then one gets that. Now, those of you who carefully now looked at my slides, now you notice that before I defined spectral form factor with 1 over d. Now here it's 1 over d squared, if we see it as survival probability. Okay, and of course we know what to do. We routinely do it every day to make it scale invariant. So what do we do? Let me repeat that. We divide it by the long time average, which is 1 over d. We measured it in the units of Heisenberg time. And then with this rescaling, we get this thing. Okay. That is the scale invariant thing. OK, that is the first lesson. Now, the second lesson um, is now not about interacting, not about ergodic. It's about quadratic systems at criticality. And that is something that. Uh, Again, the literature is very broad. I may have missed some, some references. That may be one of the first references to, to argue about that. So at criticality, survival probabilities may exhibit power load decays. And here, when one talks about survival probability, one should ask survival probability of which states. These are the states or, or the basis in which you will then ultimately localize. So you can think about that just as um, site occupation basis, product states. That goes as a power law at criticality with some exponent beta. And not only that it's power law, it's even more. Actually, this beta is related um, uh, to the fractal dimension, to the fractal dimension of the, of the, of the Hamiltonian eigenstates in this basis. So there were many works that argue kind of contributed to understanding. I mean, one of the earlier works by Ketsmerick and all, they, they use this Fourier transform between the projections in energy space that scale, that's is L is in energy domain, case with, with these two, which is related to fractal dimension, then this is the integrated survival probability, or you can just take it as survival probability. And this D should be related to the fractal dimension. I will refine actually this statement. We refined it recently. It's not exactly just fractal dimension, but I will clarify it in the next slide. Okay, so this is so far what I have used. Uh, I have shown you some well-known results. I just want to put them together, add something new to get some new understanding and, and new insights about ergodicity Excuse breaking me. transition. Excuse me. So, uh, yes. uh, look, at criticality, why you choose that kind of initial state? Means the localized. Uh, there is. A yeah, that, that's a good question. So, um, 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 
in principle, you can use any state, right? But then the answer is non-universal. If you want to see the answer, to make it simple, if you want to see this power of universality, if you want to see relationship to this fractal uh, exponent, then you have to start with a, you can call it preferred basis. That is the basis into which you're gonna localize. If you use some third basis, then this third basis will not know much about your transition because transition is the transition to a preferred basis. Yes, yes. That will be determined by beta. Yes, yes. Well, uh, we, we'll see. I will, show, I will show an example there. Okay, so how can we use all this knowledge to put it together? Is it possible to put it together so that we know we get some new understanding about ergodicity breaking transitions in finite systems and finite times? Okay, and of course, since I'm asking that, the answer is yes. What I'm going to argue is that ergodicity breaking transition can be detected through scale invariant quantum dynamics. Okay, so let me now show you um, three results of, of, of our recent, of our recent uh, studies. So the first result is about scale invariant spectral form factor at the transition. So what do I have in mind now when I say scale invariant spectral form factor? Before I already talked about scale invariant form factor, but that this is something else. This is something that in the 3D Anderson model at the transition point, this is the result. In the quantum sun model at the transition point, this is the result. So clearly you recognize the main feature. The main feature is this broad plateau, broad scale invariant plateau. Now let me argue at this point that this is not RMT universality. RMT universality is a ramp. It's here, okay? This is the tauless time. So that occurs at times much shorter than tauless time, much in interacting systems, at times much shorter than those that scale exponentially with that. Okay, this is what we call mid-time dynamics. Now. In the, in the paper, okay? And just let, let me be even more precise. Actually, the novelty of this work is this, right? So for quadratic systems, of course, that has never been calculated before, but you could read along the lines of the papers um, that some people maybe had some hint about that. I mean, it was kind of expected, not unexpected, right? So the new insight is that that actually carries through to the, to the, to the, uh, ergodicity breaking phase transitions in non -intera in interacting systems. Okay, now the second result. The second result is um, scale invariant survival probability at the transition. So what is now scale invariant survival probability? Now this is survival probability. I already introduced it before. That is for a given state. Then we average it over all initial states and disorder realizations and so on to get just P. But now the main point is that here I, I rely on the previous insights. How do we scale it? We scale it exactly as we scale the spectral form factor in every study nowadays in the ergodic phase. We do exactly the same rescaling. There is one minor detail. We here sub subtract this P infinity, which accounts for the mobility edge. If there is mobility edge, of course, one needs to be careful, but it's a technical thing. Otherwise, the message you should recall is that we do exactly the same as we do in the spectral form factor to get the ramp. The scaling, the rescaling, the scaling is the same. And with that, I will show you in the next slide, we get power law, scale invariant power law decay. And actually now this exponent beta, what we are arguing actually, is not only related to the fractal dimension. Fractal dimension, of course, is the, the way you extracted how, for example, IPR decays with the Hilbert space dimension. But also there should be something else that I think should be called house door dimension. We didn't call it that in the paper, but. Okay, let me show you a result, a result for, um, scaling, for scale invariant survival probability for three models at the transition point. One dimensional Aubrey Andre model, three dimensional Anderson model, and these are both quadratic and the quantum sun model, which is interactive. That is at the transition point, scale survival probability, clearly it, it is scale invariant, it is power law, and the exponent we verified, I'm not showing here, corresponds to the, to the among others, to the fractal dimension of the wave function. And so this scale invariance, as you see, it's very clear at the transition point. In finite systems, if you go away from the transition point, below, above, scale invariance is lost. Okay, now the third result, because my time is almost over. The third result is even maybe more fascinating, but it's, it's a work in progress. Now, so far I talked about spectral form factor survival probability, and you can say, well, these are beautiful quantities, eventually even experimentally relevant, but ultimate goal is to go to observables, one body observables. 
Yes. But you still have not related beta in no, I'm not really, no, here I'm not really, I'm, I'm not making connection to the tauless time. I'm at the transition where tauless time is Heisenberg time. So yeah, maybe that, that's the answer to your question. So the meaning of tauless time here exists if you want to, if you want to um, um, make it that way. So tauless time is scales as Heisenberg time, but that is not crucial for any of these analyses. It's not a crucial ingredient for scaling virus. Scaling virus emerge much earlier. That is the point that I'm trying to make. Okay, finally, the, the final result, which appears very intriguing for, to me. So far, we established that for quadratic models, is that even there is scale invariant dynamics of observables at the transition. Yes. Okay. Um, so, and here, even um, this observable is even the most popular observable in this case, experimentally measure, uh, measurable, which is. Um, particle imbalance on odd versus even sides. That is the imbalance. That is, I have in mind here, 3D Anderson model at half feeling. So initial state is empty, occupied, empty, occupied, and so on. So again, how do we rescale imbalance? We scale it exactly the same way as we routinely rescale spectral form factor in the ergodic phase to see the ramp. We do exactly the same thing. So that's just, not just numerical result. Actually, the first insight was, was uh, analytical because these are quadratic systems, and then one can work out the expectation values of site occupations uh, in the many body state, right? This is many body expectation values. And then because it's quadratic system, one can show this is a sum of single particle contributions. Single particle contributions include survival probability and something that we call transition probability. So probability to be initially on one side and then after time t on some other side. What we show then even that transition probabilities also exhibit scale invariant dynamics. So if you put that together, one would expect scale invariant dynamics of site occupations and of imbalance if rescaled properly. So this is now my final um, result. This is now the result for the 3D Anderson model at the critical point. I think Anderson model, as, as, as you know, it's, it's a well-studied model for 60 years. I think even for the Anderson model, I assume this is a new result. And I think it's interesting result because it tells you, you have one body observable that is experimentally measurable you rescale it that way, and you see this broad power law decay, scale invariant um, that emerges at the critical point. So you can go away from the critical point, below the critical point, above the critical point, you see that just is, uh, it just becomes broader, 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 no scale invariance. And there's even more, there is even more from that. You can ask now, what is this number? Now here on this level, that's just observation. I don't know how general that is. But it turns out, at least for this model, if you, if you think about this exponent, if you think about this exponent, beta i of the imbalance, it actually matches to second digit, the exponent of the, of the, the fractal dimension, which has pretty intriguing interpretation is that you measure decay of imbalance, one body observable, and actually from that you extract fractal dimension, which is very abstract quantity fractal dimension of the wave function at the critical point. Okay, with that, let me conclude um, since my time is over. So if I had to just be brief and give you one sentence, what is the main uh, take home message of this talk? My main uh, message is that in finite systems, there exist clear smoking guns of ergodicity breaking transition. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you for this very nice talk. So since there were already some questions, so maybe one or two while the next speaker is. Uh, so the shorter time scale at which it, uh, the scale invariance emerges, how does that time scale uh, change with the scale with the system size? Um, yeah, um, I, I can give you a, a wake, a wake uh, answer. It is either order one or something that mildly scales with L. So um, now the thing is that it's, the question is here, right? So when do we enter this uh, uh, scale invariant regime? So this 10 to minus four, this is the, the 3D model with roughly 10 to the four sides. So this is roughly order one. Now, whether it mildly scales with L or not, I cannot judge at this point. But it's something definitely much shorter than any exponential scale. Yeah. Just one quick question. And so 
is this scale invariant dynamics now observable in, um, in, in any observable or just the imbalance? Yeah, thank you for this question. Of course, um, it, it goes back to this, um, um, let me see. Um, of course, just, just to be fair, not to any observable. Of course, this imbalance has a property, has an important property. I, it's, it's hidden here, but let me, let me make it more clear. Uh, the eigenbasis of the imbalance operator is the same as eigenbasis of this uh, M's from which you calculate survival probability. That is the key point. If you have an, uh, so everything that is like site occupations or products of site occupations, on, that will work. If you have something else like kinetic energy, kinetic energy, eigenbasis of kinetic energy is not the site occupation basis. Then I have no predictions for that. So you need any observable that's diagonal in yeah, the yeah. site occupation. Yes, yes, exactly. Okay. In, in we of time. I'm sure there will be a lot of time. And you really want to ask. Yeah, that. let's continue then. Continue later. Yeah, so you have shown here uh, that survival probability scales with the multifactor dimension. Uh, something t to the power minus beta. Yeah. Right. So is there any connection with the transport? Like like survival probability and transport is connected, right? Yeah, that's a good question. For this particular quantity, no. Yeah, so, so you, you were asking, uh, um, so of course, a well-defined question is, there is a dynamical exponent at this point. How does dynamical exponent scale? These are interesting questions. Does this dynamical exponent appear in this quantity? The answer is no. It appears in some other quantities, not in this quantity. Okay, then let's yeah. thank, thank Leo you. once more, and then I'm sure he will be busy also.